Okay, so you've started your YouTube channel and you've been uploading videos on a pretty consistent basis, but for some reason, you're just not getting any closer to those 4,000 watch hours that are required to get monetized. Well, you're not alone. Although many new content creators do tend to reach the 1,000 subscriber mark within the first 12 months after launching their channel, many creators continue to struggle for months and sometimes even years after that point just trying to obtain the 4,000 watch hours which will allow them to finally start making money on their channel. And I can say this from experience because I was one of them. Although it only took me around 14 months to get my first 1,000 subscribers, it would take me over 18 months to hit that 4,000 watch hour goal. And the sad news is, is that I could have reached that goal about four months earlier if it wasn't for my own ignorance. You see, I made a mistake that many of you who are watching this video right now are making on your own channel as well. A mistake that's costing you hundreds, if not thousands of watch hours every month. And in this video, I'm going to show you what that simple mistake is and how to fix it. So if you're someone who's struggling to hit that 4,000 watch hour quota, then stick around because this video is for you. Hey guys, Craig here. Hope everybody's doing well. Okay, so to correct this mistake, I'm actually going to have to break the solution down into three separate parts. Now, I just want to point something out. I actually did each one of these parts individually for at least the first two years of my channel, but it wasn't until about April of 2023 that I started doing all three of them together. And as soon as I did, my watch hours increased on average about 500% on pretty much all of my videos across the board. Okay, so the first thing you need to do to increase your watch time hours is start by breaking up your videos into dedicated playlists. Now when I say dedicated playlists, I'm not just talking about breaking them up for some random reason, like these are all the videos where I have facial hair, and these are all the videos that I'm clean shaven. No, what you want to be doing is creating playlists that are kind of a continuing series, so that if a viewer watches one video from your playlist, there's a pretty good chance that they're also going to want to watch the next few videos just to get the answers to any questions they may have after watching the first video. Let me give you an example. So if the first video that someone watches on my channel is my video 3 Proven Methods of Making Money with KDP and they know absolutely nothing about self-publishing low and medium content books, what do you think their first question will be after watching that video? Probably, how do I create a low content book? And that just happens to be video number two in my playlist, Self-Publishing 101. And after they finish creating their book's interior, what do you think their next question is going to be? How do I create a book cover? And that's video number three in my playlist. Now along the way, they may run into some trouble trying to figure out how to use margins and bleeds. No problem. That's video number four. And once the book is finally done, their next question will probably be, how do I upload it to KDP? video number five in the playlist, and it just keeps going on and on. Do you want to know how to spruce up your Amazon product page? Watch video number six. Need some help promoting your book? That's what video number seven's about. Want to start an Amazon ad campaign? Watch video number eight. And once the entire process from creation to promotion is finished, then the next obvious step would be to start creating different types of books, and that's exactly where the playlist goes next. You need to set your playlists up in a way where you're actually anticipating what your viewer's next question is going to be, and each subsequent video that you create should be the answer to that question. And if you do that, you'll be keeping your viewers on your channel and watching your videos for a much longer duration of time. But that's only the first step. I mean, it's great that you've created some really engaging playlists, but those playlists are completely useless if you're not encouraging your viewers to watch them. And this is where step number two comes in. Now inside of my video, Three Proven Methods to Make Money with KDP, I could easily suggest to my viewer that they watch my video on how to create low content books to sell on Amazon. But what if they already know how to create low content books? Then I just wasted an opportunity to keep this viewer on my channel. You see, every viewer is coming to my channel possessing a different level of skill, and there's absolutely no way for me to know what that skill level is ahead of time. But if I'm creating a playlist that follows the process of self-publishing in sequential order, then chances are the video that they need to watch next is probably somewhere in this list. And by sending them to a playlist instead of a single video, I'm not only eliminating the risk of losing them because the video I recommended to them doesn't pertain to them, but depending on where their skill level is, I'm also increasing my chances of getting them to watch multiple videos instead of just one. Because if what they need help with is adding A-plus content to their Amazon product page, 
then because this playlist is in sequential order, then every video after this one should be of interest to them as well. And that's how you start to increase your watch hours. But that's only part of the solution. There's still one more extremely important step that you have to take to make this all work. Yes, you need to recommend your playlist to your viewers, but there's a right way and a wrong way to go about doing it. And that's where step three comes in. Now, what I like to do in each of my videos is incorporate two referrals. The first one is almost always for an individual video, and I make that referral very early on in the video. I try to find a way to reference a subject that I've already covered extensively in a previous video. And then I just let my viewer know that I have a video on my channel that covers that subject in more depth. And I simply let them know that I will be leaving a link to that video at the end of the video that they're currently watching. And that whole scenario usually plays out something like this. So in the month of May, Adobe paid me $192.81. On a side note, if you're interested, I have a video that shows you how to find high paying affiliate programs that I'll put a link to at the end of this video. Now when it comes to the playlist recommendation, that always happens during the last few seconds of my video. If you've been consuming content on YouTube for any length of time, then I'm sure you've seen a video end screen. It's just basically a screen that might have the words thanks for watching or please subscribe, as well as one or two additional video suggestions that the content creator would like you to watch. Now a lot of end screens cover the entire screen. In fact, the majority of end screens being sold on sites like Etsy are full screens, and you don't want that. And the reason for that is, is that as soon as your viewer sees that final screen pop up that says thanks for watching, they're going to take that as a sign that the video is over and they're going to click off your video. I mean, think about when you're watching a movie in a theater. What usually happens when the screen goes black and the credits start to roll? 99% of the audience gets up and leaves the theater. But have you ever noticed what happens at the end of a movie when they start showing the blooper reel on one half of the screen and the credits on the other half? About 30% of the audience stays seated to watch the bloopers. Subconsciously, those viewers are being told that the movie isn't over yet. And as long as there is still footage playing on that screen, many viewers will keep watching. And that's why you never want to use a full screen. You need to keep the conversation as well as the eye contact going right to the very end of your video. Because as long as you're still engaging your viewer, there's a far better chance of them staying to the very end of your video to hear you promote your playlist. And this is the reason why you only want to use a split screen for your end screen. Now you can make one of these yourself, but just know it can be a little tricky. The videos and subscribe icon can't just be placed anywhere on the end screen. There are actually designated slots for them. So you need to make sure that your graphics align perfectly with those slots. And this can take some time. So to help you out, I'm going to make my end screen template, which is already perfectly aligned for use in YouTube, and which is also completely customizable to your own brand, available in my Gumroad store for $5. The end screen pack comes in two sizes, HD and 4K, as well as two styles, rip seam and straight seam for those who want a cleaner look on their end screen. And all of these templates can be customized in either Photoshop or by using the free software at photop.com if you don't have access to Photoshop. And I'll put a link to my end screen template in the description section of this video. And just so you don't have to spend any of your own time trying to figure out how to customize my template, I'm going to walk you through how to do that right now. So if you're ready, let's get to it. Okay, so if you purchase my end screen package, it'll come packed in an RAR zip file. If you don't have Windows RAR extraction software on your computer, I've provided a link at the bottom of my Gumroad page to a website where you can download it for free. Once you unzip the package, you'll find that there are two folders inside of it. One is for use with HD 1920x1080 videos, and the other is for 4K 3840x2160 videos. And inside of each of those folders, you'll find two Photoshop PSD files. One file contains an end screen with a rip style seam, which is identical to the one that I use at the end of my videos, while the other file contains an end screen that has a straight seam. And just know that regardless of which size or style of end screen you use, both the video and the logo placeholders will line up perfectly in the YouTube uploader. Now before you use any of these files, it's a good idea to make a copy of the entire pack as a backup just in case you accidentally move one of the placeholders. To do that, all you have to do is right click on the end screen pack folder and choose copy. Then just right click anywhere beside that folder and choose paste. You can rename the file to end screen backup and then just save it somewhere on your computer. Okay, so once you decide on which end screen you're going to use, when you double click on the PSD file and open it up in Photoshop or Photopea, this is what you'll see. If you go over to the layers menu in the right hand column, you'll see all of the different layers that make up this end screen. 
If you don't see the Layers menu in the right-hand column, just go up to the Windows tab in the top menu and open it from there. Okay, so I'm going to start off by just going through what each layer is. The first and second layers are just two arrow buttons. The third and fourth layers are the text layers. The fifth and sixth layers are the two video placeholders. The seventh layer is the logo placeholder. The eighth layer is the rip scene, or straight scene, depending on which version you're using. The ninth layer is a semi-transparent pattern, and the last layer is the background layer. And you can customize each of these layers any way you want. Now just keep in mind that you don't have to use all of these layers if you don't want to. If you don't want to have your logo on your end screen, you can just turn it off. It's entirely up to you. And that goes for this pattern layer as well. The only reason that it's here is because this is the pattern that I use as the backdrop behind the animated text in my videos, so it kind of matches my branding. So if you like this pattern, you could just change the background color to suit your channel branding. And to change the background color, or the color of any of these graphics, all you have to do is select the layer, go down to the bottom menu, and click on the FX icon. And then from the menu, choose Color Overlay. Then, inside of the Color Overlay menu, just double click on the color swatch, and from the color picker, choose the color that you want your background to be. And then, you could just do the exact same thing with the seam and placeholder layers, by just adding a color overlay that's suitable to your new background color. But again, you don't have to use this pattern overlay. You can just bring in a background image that has the pattern that you want baked right into it. Now, whatever image you do decide to use for your background, make sure that it's high quality. In other words, if you're using the HD template, make sure that your background image is larger than 1920 by 1080. The last thing that you want is a pixelated background image. A great place to get high quality backgrounds is Creative Fabrica. And if you use my affiliate links that I've placed in the description section of this video, you can either get a 30-day free trial, which comes with 10 free downloads, or you can get 80% off of a one-year unlimited download subscription. Okay, so once you've chosen the background of your choice, all you have to do is open it up in Photoshop, and then using your rectangle marquee tool, select it and copy it by hitting Ctrl C on your keyboard. Or you can go up to the Edit tab in the top menu and choose Copy from the drop-down menu. Then just go back to your end screen template, make sure that you have the background layer selected, and then just hit Ctrl V on your keyboard. Or you can go up to the Edit menu in the top menu once again and choose Paste. Now, just select the new background texture layer and hit Ctrl T on your keyboard. This will allow you to resize it just a bit. You want the image to be slightly overlapping the edge of the artboard. It's probably a good idea to reduce the opacity of this layer down to about 75%, just so that you can see where the underlying background ends. Now, just line the background texture up so that the part of the pattern that you want showing is over top of the black background below it. So the only part of this background pattern that we're going to be keeping is what's showing over top of the black background right here. Once you have the graphic lined up the way you want it, click the check mark in the top menu to release the image from transform mode and raise the opacity of the layer back up to 100%. Now select the original black background layer and place your cursor over the swatch. Right click on it and choose select pixels. Next, go up to the Select tab in the top menu, and from the drop-down menu, choose Inverse. Now, with the selection still highlighted, select the pattern background layer you just brought in, and then hit your Delete key. Then, just select your Rectangle Marquee tool one more time, and just left-click somewhere outside of the artboard to turn off the selection. So this image is now your new background. Rename the layer to New Background, and then lock both that layer and the original background layer below it. You can also turn off the bottom back layer as well. Now you're probably not going to want that pattern overlay over top of it, so just keep that layer turned off. The next layer you want to turn on is the rip seam layer, so that you can change the color of it. So select that layer and unlock it, and then just go down to the bottom menu and select the effects icon. From the pop-up menu, choose color overlay. Then, double-click on the swatch in the Color Overlay menu, and when the Color Picker opens up, just drag your cursor on top of your background image. Doing that will change your cursor to an eyedropper. Then, just choose one of the brighter accent colors from your background image. You want to make sure that your placeholders are using a color that's already in your background image. Doing this will keep your overall color palette cohesive. Once you've got that done, just click OK on both the Color Picker and the Color Overlay menus. Now it's time to turn on your logo placeholder as well as your two video placeholders and unlock them. 
Then select your rip seam layer, right click on it, and from the pop-up menu, choose copy layer style. Then go back up and select those three placeholder layers, right click on them, and choose paste layer style from the pop-up menu. All of your placeholders should now be the same color as your rip seam. Now, just lock out all four of those altered layers. Next, go up and turn your text layers back on. And again, if you want to change the wording, font style, or color of your text, you can. To change the font style or color, simply select the text layer that you want to change, unlock it, and then go up to the Characters tab in the top right-hand menu. If you don't see that tab, just go over to the Windows tab in the top menu and open it from there. Then just change the color to whatever you want or the font style to whatever you want. The font that is currently loaded in this template is called Boogaloo, and it's just a standard Google font, which should be on your computer already. But if it's not, you can just download it from the internet for free by doing a Google search for it. And just know that it's a font that you can use for commercial purposes as well. But you can use any font style that you want. Now if you want to change the wording, just select your text tool in the left hand menu and then place your cursor at the end of the text that you want to change and then click on it. Then just hit your backspace key and then type in whatever you want. Once you're done changing your text, be sure to lock out those layers. And the last thing you have to do is turn on your arrow icons. Once again, if you don't like the color of those arrows, just unlock those layers and add a color overlay to them, just like you did with the rip seam. And just to make sure that they match, right click on the arrow that you just changed and then choose copy layer style from the pop-up menu. Then select the other arrow layer, right click on it and choose paste layer style. And then just lock both of those layers back up once you're done. Now, if you're not sure what background to use for your end screen, ideally the best option would be to just use the same background that you use for your channel homepage banner. That way you're tying your end screen to the branding of your channel. So here are a few examples. So if this was your channel banner, you might want to use this section here of the background. Just keep in mind to use the same high resolution image that you originally used to create your banner when you're adding it to your end screen. And as for the seam and placeholders, I would just sample this accent color and use it as my color overlay. And your background image doesn't have to be dark either. If the background of your banner is lighter in color like it is in this image, you can still use it. Just sample some of the darker colors from the banner to use on your text, arrows, and placeholders. But keep in mind that you don't want your background pattern to be too busy. Because remember, 90% of these placeholders are going to be covered up by either video thumbnails or your channel icon. And chances are, those graphics are going to be busy as well. So for that reason, try to keep your background pattern fairly simple. Once you finish customizing your end screen template, simply export it out as a PNG file. Then, whenever you're editing one of your videos, just import the end screen into your editing software and place it over about the last 20 seconds or so of your lead out footage. You can just drag it to the length you need it to be, like so. Now all you have to do is select your underlying A-roll footage and then go up to the editing window and slide the footage horizontally to the left under the position tab. Just do your best to center your torso between the left edge of the screen and your channel icon. Once your video has been rendered out and uploaded to YouTube, you'll be able to place your playlist and video recommendations as well as your channel icon perfectly over top of your placeholders in the end screen section of the uploader. So as you can see, this end screen template is fairly simple to customize. And once again, if you'd like to purchase it, it's available in my Gumroad store for $5 and I have a link to it in the description section of this video. So to recap, step one is to create dedicated playlists on your channel that contain videos that answer the questions that your viewers may have after watching any of your previous videos. And try to keep your playlists in sequential order so that your viewers will just naturally move on to the next video. Step number two is to always be promoting your playlists at the end of every video. And once again, only promote the playlist that the video your viewer is currently watching is part of. Don't be promoting other playlists containing videos that have nothing to do with what your viewer is watching. If they're not interested in the content that the other playlist is made up of, then they're just going to leave your channel. And finally, step three is to use a professional looking split end screen. Don't use a full screen. You want to keep your viewer engaged right into the very last second of your video. If you start incorporating these three steps into all of your videos, you are going to see your watch time hours increase immensely. Now, if you're just getting started on YouTube and you need a little guidance, then be sure and check out my Getting Started on YouTube playlist. It has everything you'll need to get your YouTube journey up and running. And you can find a link to it right here. Until next time, take care.